Hi everyone and welcome to the Emergency Physicians ECG course. This is Hisham Ibrahim, I'm one of the Emergency Medicine Consultants in the United Kingdom and today we're going to be discussing case number 46 from our Facebook page. Before we make a start with the great case that I'm planning to discuss today, I'd like to start by saying that we're actually expanding our team in Hampshire Hospital. So that includes uh, new posts for doctors and nurses at different levels. So if you're interested in joining our ED family, please feel free to visit the department website and, uh, and hopefully we will work together very soon. The other thing that I'd like to mention before we start is, um, as we've started uh, doing recently, there will be a picture at the end of this uh, presentation and it'll be, um, I'll be really interested to see what you think about this picture, where do you think it's been taken from. So without any further delays, let's move on and talk about our case today. So our case today might take a little bit longer for a discussion, but I'm sure you will enjoy it. I've personally really enjoyed it. It is a good case that, um, we, that will allow us to cover a topic that we don't see that often, but it's really serious and uh, we shouldn't really miss it when we see it. So our case is about a 14 year old boy who collapsed while cycling outdoors. So found by the paramedical crew to, have, uh, to be in VT, received two shocks and he's now got ROSC. During the period of resuscitation, the rhythm strip that came out of the uh, ECG machine was this one. So as I always say, this is the time to pause the video, have a detailed look at this, try to figure out what's going on here. Okay, you've had enough I guess, so let's move on and see what happened next. So shortly after the ROSC, the blood pressure dropped, so the pre-hospital critical care team decided to give a small dose of IV adrenaline as a cardiovascular support drug, uh, which is a commonly given drug in this situation. So they did this, and immediately after, the child went, to, uh, went back into VT again. So at this point, everyone started scratching their heads and thinking, what is going on here? Something is not quite right. So let's see, let's start thinking about it and, uh, and see if we can analyze the ECG and figure out what is going on in this case. So here is our ECG and we can clearly say once we see this that we're dealing with the tachycardia with broad complexes. So we're dealing with probably VT and it is regular. And uh, the interesting thing about it is the direction of the complexes. So the complexes here are this complex is got this direction pointing up and then this one is going down and then up and then down and that's been the case throughout the whole rhythm strip so the direction of the complex changes the axis changes with each beat about 100, 180 degrees when you see this in a broad complex regular tachycardia think about this condition there is only one thing that can cause that it is bi-directional vt so this is the condition that we're going to talk about today let's talk about this let's see what we should know about bi-directional vt basically bi-directional vt is a rare ventricular dysrhythmia that is characterized by a beat to beat alternation in the axis of the qrs complex it is 180 change, 180 degree change in the axis. So one is going to be pointing up, one is going to be pointing down. So this is an example from Light in the Fast Lane Library. And as you can clearly see here, in the, especially in the rhythm strip, so the axis changes with every beat by 180 degrees. So pointing up, pointing down throughout the whole rhythm strip. Here's another example from uh, the same library. And, and again, a really scary looking ECG, if you see something like this, you should be scared. But if we look at lead uh, one, for example, so we can see the direction of the complexes. So we can tell that we've got a broad complex, regular tachycardia with an alternation of the axis every single beat. Same things apply, same thing apply for the v, V6. So again, direction down, then up, then down, then up. So that is again bi-directional VT. And um, there has been some signs that's been reported with this. So that is one of the, I would call it a fun sign uh, that's been reported. They call it the Christmas tree sign. 
um, that is associated with um, bidirectional VT. And in this article, they've described it as this. So they're saying that when you see an ECG like this, then um, apart from being scared, if you flip the ECG anti-clockwise, then you will start seeing the Christmas trees. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, I do not really think that the first thing that will come to my head when I see an ECG like this one is to start thinking about Christmas trees. I personally will have very different thoughts uh, about that, but I'm not going to comment on this in here. So, uh, fine, let's move on and see uh, what else we need to know. One of the common questions that I always get in in terms of this topic is how to differentiate bidirectional BT from ventricular bigeminy. And uh, it is not that difficult to differentiate. This is an example of a ventricular bigeminy. And bigeminy means that you're getting a PVC, so a premature ventricular complex, uh, every other beat. But by definition, a premature ventricular complex is a complex that looks different from other complexes and actually it happens earlier than expected followed by a pause so for between these two beats i'll be expecting that the beat in the middle will happen somewhere here in the middle but actually this is the tip of the complex so this beat has happened here so this beat came earlier than expected followed by a pause earlier than expected followed by a pause and same applies here in addition to that, normal beats preceded by a clear P wave, while the PVC is not preceded by a P wave because it's coming from the ventricle. So that is the bidirectional, uh, sorry, that is the ventricular bigeminy. While a bidirectional VT, the complexes will be very regular. So it will look like this. So, um, so that is the difference between the bidirectional VT versus ventricular bigeminy. So let's move on. This is our case um, that was uh, sent to me by uh, my friend and, um, and consultant colleague, Dr. Louisa Chan, who is a pre-hospital uh, consultant and an emergency uh, medicine consultant as well in Hampshire Hospital. And um, yeah, so she was dealing with this and looking at the ECG especially, in uh, this part of the ECG, you can clearly say that the direction is changing 180 degrees with every beat. And also, uh, the tip of this beat is going to be just before the complex here. So that will be the kind of the order. And if you put it that way, you will notice that things are very regular. So that is a bidirectional VT case. Moving on to the causes of bidirectional VT. So if you're dealing with an adult, think digoxin toxicity. If you're dealing with a child, think CPVT. And there are some other reported causes like the herbal aconite poisoning or hypokalemia and uh, some cases of um, MI and myocarditis. So to be honest, when you see a bidirectional VT case, your options are very limited and your differential is not that broad. And considering that we are dealing with a 14 year old child that is probably not on digoxin and probably not having an MI, the answer in this case was CPVT. So let's talk about this condition and find out a bit more about it. So CPVT stands for catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. It's also known as exercise induced polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And um, it is a genetic condition that is uh, happening with a prevalence of one into 10,000. When it comes to the presentation of CPVT, this is basically a patient who will present to you with recurrent episodes of syncope that occurs during exercise or with acute emotional distress. It happens in individuals without actually any structural heart problems. And the underlying cause of these symptoms, uh, I mean the syncope, is ventricular tachycardia, whether it is a bidirectional one or polymorphic ones. These arrhythmias are usually self-terminating, so um, hence they present with syncope rather than cardiac arrest. Uh, but in some cases, ventricular tachycardia may degenerate into VF and it can cause sudden cardiac death. 
So the mean age of presentation is usually 7 to 12 years old and the onset uh, can happen in later age of, uh, of life. So sometimes in the fourth decade, they have their first syncopal event. And if untreated, this is a very serious condition. CPVT is a highly lethal condition. 30% of affected individuals would experience at least one cardiac arrest. I mean, before the last one that they don't come back from. And uh, in 80% of cases, uh, they get one or more syncopal events. So sudden death may be the first manifestation of this disease. So we are talking about a really serious condition in here that is highly lethal. So the question is gonna be, so if we suspect this, what do we do? What sort of investigations that happens for CPVT patients? They get what's called exercise stress test. So basically they put them in ex on exertion and uh, they monitor the ECG during this. So look at this one. So at rest um, in the uh, first rhythm strip, we can clearly see here that it is just a normal ECG. Then after 0.5 minutes of exercise, we started having PVCs that are actually looking like a ventricular by Gemini. So these beats came earlier than expected, followed by a pause, so I would call this ventricular by Gemini. Then after one minute, we started getting bidirectional VT. One and a half minutes, that is a clear bidirectional VT. Then with recovery, and after four minutes, we are kind of back to normal. So that is the exercise test. Uh, that they do for these cases to reveal it. Then we come to the treatment. And the treatment is the interesting part in here. So beta blockers is the mainstay of CPVT therapy. And flicanide can be added if beta blockers are not controlling symptoms. And obviously ICD if cardiac arrest happens despite medical therapy. So that's regarding the broad line of treatment in between episodes. But what about the cardiac arrest management? This is the really interesting part of this case. We all know that the cardiac arrest management in every guideline uh, that is uh, published around, the mainstay of treatment so far are the CPR, the defibrillation, and the only drug that everyone is recommending giving so far is the adrenaline. But in this particular case, we're dealing with a VT that is induced by adrenaline. So are you going to give adrenaline to treat this case? That is the biggest question that we need to answer. Here is a paper that I found uh, talking about this particular topic coming from the Pediatric Critical Care Medicine uh, Journal. And they uh, talked here about the catecholamine polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and they said it is the cardiac arrest where epinephrine is contraindicated. So in the conclusion of this study, they suggested that we should have a high suspicion uh, to diagnose CPVT um, when we deal with children in cardiac arrest, especially because we know that the most common cause of cardiac arrest in children is hypoxia and the cardiac causes are not that common compared to adults. And if we are in a situation where we are facing ventricular arrhythmia that is not responding appropriately to the standard re resuscitation protocols, then we should consider other lines of treatment because it might be CPVT. So they are suggesting IV opiates, general anesthesia, and potentially flicanide, and to avoid giving adrenaline as uh, this can be life-saving. When we talk about the IV opiates, they're talking mainly about IV fentanyl um, with a general anesthesia trying to blunt the sympathetic response. So that was from this study. I tried to find more and, uh, and there wasn't too much online regarding these cases, but I found a really interesting one that I'm gonna share with you now. So it is coming from Dr. Smith Block, the famous uh, emergency uh, medicine um, professor uh, with a special interest in ECG interpretation and emergency cardiology. Um, and um, he was talking about this case in one of his blogs and he talked about what to do during cardiac arrest. And what he suggested was 
to give DC cardioversion, but he suggested to do this with beta blockers as pretreatment if possible, because the DC cardioversion, the shock itself on its own, can cause catecholamine surge. So that will make things even worse. So he suggested giving the IV beta blockers even before the DC cardioversion to blunt that catecholamine effect that can happen with DC cardioversion. And obviously, IV beta blockers. And what he suggested was ismolol 0.5 milligram per kilogram. When I talked to one of the regional uh, electrophysiology consultants uh, for pediatric cardiology in, in my region, in UK, um, his suggestion was exactly the same. So he said, for cases like this, you should give ismolol during cardiac arrest, which is a drug that is available in uh, many of the pre with many of the pre-hospital teams, and it is available in many of the emergency departments. And in my department, we have a protocol for resistant VF cardiac arrest. When you're faced with a patient in VF and you've kept going with the ALS algorithm and you didn't really reach ROSC at all. When you start getting that kind of VF storm or uh, resistant VF, we in our protocol, we suggest giving ismolol. And now in my head, if I'm faced with resistant VT as well, I'm going to consider giving ismolol for that particular reason. So that's regarding the treatment during cardiac arrest and obviously not to give adrenaline at all to these patients. So if we go back to our case to find out what happened, we've talked about a 14 year old boy who collapsed while cycling, found to be in VT, received two shocks and uh, now has got ROSC. We know that the rhythm strip that's been done during resuscitation showed this. So that's the one. And looking at this one, we know now that this is a bidirectional VT rhythm strip. And, um, and we know now that uh, this, uh, this child is likely to have um, CPVT, but that was not available uh, as a piece of information for the pre-hospital team when they, uh, when they saw the patient. But interestingly, the police phoned the mother while resuscitating the child and, um, and actually she told them he's got CPVT. So that changed the plans for the child. The child has been transferred to the regional center for pediatric intensive care units. And, uh, and actually he did really well and he was discharged home later with an ICD in place after a full neurological recovery. So that was a great save from the pre-hospital team and I'd like to thank Lou Chan so much for keeping the story for me. And um, yeah, that was it regarding this case. So let's uh, quickly summarize the take home points in this case. So when it comes to bidirectional BT, we know now it's caused by, if it's an adult, think digoxin toxicity and be careful because that is a dangerous one to miss because that is a VT that will not respond to any line of treatment other than the digibind. So you will keep treating with following the ALS algorithm for uh, VT and you're not going to reach anywhere because you need to give digibind. So it's important to diagnose it. If it is in a child, think CPVT. And we know that there are some other causes um, that's been reported like hypokalemia and ACS. When it comes to CPVT, we know now that it can cause cardiac arrest that gets worse with adrenaline and DC shock. So you will be faced with a refractory VT. And if you keep following the ALS algorithm to treat this VT, you will keep making things worse. The treatment in this situation is to avoid adrenaline and to give IV beta blockers. So specifically, ismolol IV. And this is it regarding this case. So I uh, hope you found uh, this discussion useful. I'm really sorry it took us longer this time, but I thought this is an interesting case that I wanted to really cover uh, well. Uh, the final thing is uh, to look at this picture and to think about where do you think this is taken from? If you know the answer, please write it down in the show notes. I'm also planning to put in the show notes the links for all the papers that I've used to prepare this presentation. And um, I will uh, talk to you soon. So stay safe. Thank you.